So first, I want to say thank you. I'm very excited to be here. Um, the first executive summit I was supposed to attend for Tatanga was in 2020 when it got canceled. So I'm really happy that we're all together. The other piece is I want to say thank you to the warm introduction, but also thank you so much for letting me follow Guy and Jeffrey. <laughs> um, my whole thought process as I was sitting is, oh my gosh, this is going to be a tough act to follow, but I'm going to do my best. Um, I also think a little bit about me, a little bit of context. So my name is Stephanie Comerdell. Um, I've officially been in the business of CS for about 15 years now. Um, I started, though, my career, I've always been in CS when I think back on it, because it started in professional services and it moved over to a new title, but it was still the same premise, successful customers. And so all good stories have a beginning, and my story that I'm a focus on started 10 months ago. So I am not even a year into Extreme Networks, and as Jamie um, indicated, I've done this now three times, starting from the ground up, and what's amazing, small world, is that my peers from both ServiceNow, as well as from Lucid, are actually in the room, that were part of those journeys with me. So um, again, delighted to be here. And I'm going to focus today not on so much the what. I'm going to get into the execution and the specific tactics. But I'm really going to spend more time on the how, because for me, <laughs> that has been, um, that's been my own journey at Extreme. So for those of you that may not know Extreme Networks, a little bit about us. When I started at Extreme back in April, we were celebrating our 25th year. So we've been in business for 25 years. Um, we are traditionally a hardware company. That was our start. Um, we got our innovation really 25 years ago as we entered into the networking industry through our hardware. And we've continued that. That has been one of our backbone, one of our principles that has stayed with us. We also, we do not have the biggest, because I know we have some competitors in here, but we do have the fastest growing cloud management platform in the industry today, in the market. And we're expanding that solution and other solutions into new markets as well. And so when I was asked to join, CS, you know, to come into Extreme and build CS and build a new muscle, because it was completely new to a company that had been doing business the same way for a very long time, but very successfully, um, one of my first questions was, why now? And the answer I got was, well, very transparently, um, you know, we just launched our latest innovation in our switches, and we attached a freemium. So it goes back to, lo and behold, the good old freemium. And we're just, we're not seeing the success that we thought we would. So they asked me, that was the birth of the idea, we need CS. <laughs> we probably really need to rethink if we're going to continue our path into the cloud, continuing to build on a backbone of cloud technologies, we need to have a customer success team that's really going to be the momentum behind our subscription business. And so, I landed the job. I was very excited. Um, yes. Um, and so, you know, the first thing that myself, the executive team, and the other thing that most people find very interesting is my organization is being built in product. So I'm not part of the revenue organization. I sit and I report directly into our chief technology and chief product officer. And so one of the things that we first embarked upon was in order to do this, we knew we had to become customer-centric. And we also knew that what that really meant was it wasn't just going to be the tagline. It wasn't just going to be part of our story. We had to really embody it. We had to build it into the DNA of every person on our team. We had to embed it in the culture. But we also had to create it as an ethos in the organization. And what that meant for us was that every time someone was making a decision, the customer was central in thought. That is so much easier said than done. And so my first 90 days were pretty interesting. Um, for me, I'm very impatient. So I like to just, you know, one of my favorite expressions by Amelia Earhart is, to do it, you just have to do it. Patience is not a virtue that I have. It's a working area. So um, of course, one of the first things that I thought of was, I need to know what I'm facing. So my first 90 days was pretty interesting. The first 45 days, I focused internally. I mapped my organizations. I learned who my stakeholders were. 
not my naysayers or my detractors, but really, who are the people that did not fundamentally understand what I was going to be doing? And who did I have to help to bring into my community, my support system? What I learned very quickly was my main challenges in everything I was about to do was data integrity, process adherence, and change management, all of which had varying degrees of success, capability, and honestly, existence um, in any kind of formalized way. And so with that, I said, OK, now that I know what my, where, where are my pitfalls, where are my, where are my blind spots going to be, I then started the next 45 days focusing on my customer and my partners and really interviewing them, talking to them, and understanding. And I love the three questions that Jeffrey put. What's working well? What should we keep doing? What do you want us to start doing? And what are the most important things to you and your business that you're looking to extreme to help fulfill? And with that, that began the next piece, which was we started to create customer centricity through how we built our strategy, through how we looked at go-to-market. So we didn't start with the organization. We didn't start with which playbook were we going to do first. Where we started was working with product, because I was in product. This was great uh, for the first time. Was what are going to be the outcomes of the products that you really want us to employ, that you want us to deliver high growth, velocity, success, build momentum with that customer so that we can expand. And so with that, we defined for one product, what are the outcomes? Because we were testing. We're like, let's see what we can do here. And so we defined those outcomes, those pivotal use cases. Not that they were all encompassing, not that they were perfect, but they gave us a great launch port for what we wanted to do. We then said about, now that we know the outcomes, what's our strategy? What plays are we going to do? What's going to be important to the customer? Oh, by the way, let's ask our customers, what would you like for that outcome to deliver? What's important to you in the product? And then from there, at this point, I'm still a team of one. <laughs> My days were very busy. Um, but at this point, it was really, OK, now that we know what we want to do and we know what outcomes we need to deliver, who's the team? What's the organization that we need to build to do this? And so I was very blessed in that you know, I had that monumental white sheet of paper, so blank sheet. And then at the same token, I had the enormous task of <laughs> I have this wonderful blank sheet that I need to start filling. And so I set about first hiring my key leadership. Um, and again, very lucky, I pulled from past experiences, past work experiences. And so every leader that I have in my organization had worked with me previously. So they knew me, I knew them. And that enabled us to move fast, because we just knew each other. We had very easy handoffs. And we also, I knew that I completely could trust what they were going to go do, because we had done it before. So that enabled us to go very fast. And then we set about, and then just as a sneak peek, I started as you know, number one. And today, we have 32 people in the organization. So this was really over six months, because my first three months were my learning months and my, my set the stage months. And then now we're in the stage of we're executing relentlessly. And I'll talk a little bit about what we did first and what we're about to do next. Um, and then ultimately, the whole goal is to deliver the outcomes. So for us, those customer outcomes had to be tied to product vision. For me, it was really important that not only could we realize value throughout the journey with a customer, but it had to deliver on the promise of the product, which means the products had to be built to deliver the value. And so for us, that meant the infinite enterprise, which is our North Star. So we are building our products, our solutions, our capabilities to address and deliver the infinite enterprise to customers. So infinitely distributed, this means that we're meeting our customers, ultimately our consumers, where they are, whether they're in their living room, they're in the store, they're at the hospital, wherever they are. We're meeting them where they live, where they work. The other piece is that key word, not just customer-centric, but consumer-centric. So we had to make sure that we were focused on 
the outcomes of our customers, but also the consumers of our services and capabilities down to the user level. And then the other piece was we had to do our delivery at scale. So there had to be a personalization to it to where it wasn't just scaled to many, but it also scaled back to one. So for CS, this enabled me to immediately find my hooks. What can I deliver value to? How can I engage in a meaningful way with not only our customers, our partners, but also internally in the organization because Extreme is a company of 3,100 people. And so I knew that my three mantras, and you might notice I like things in threes, uh, make it easy to engage, empower the customer, so give the control to the customer, and deliver continuous value. So one of the things that I learned early on, and some of you will hearken back to the early days of CS, and you had moments of, you know, moments that matter, moments of delight, moments of truth, moments of value. But for me, it meant every interaction that we had with the customer had to deliver value to them. Because every step of the way, customers are making decisions. Do, or do they stay engaged with us? Are they still a customer? They have options. So for me, it was how do I embed value across the entire journey? And that meant how do I influence not just my internal organization, but how do I influence the stakeholders around me? And that goes back to the 45 days of really learning my landscape. So now that I had a strategy, and I have the tactics, and we'll talk about that in part of execution, this really became how, what is my organization going to look like? So one of the things that may stand out to everybody is that services product management. <laughs> so for me, one of the key things that I did first, and many of you may feel the pain of this, or at least you have at some point, I knew that no matter what, I was going to have to rationalize a portfolio of professional services, support services, expert services, managed services, to make space for customer success at the table. And so I set about doing this in that it was easy. I said, just let them, let them come be with me. We're going to build a success portfolio. And that will embody all of those things, but we're really going to rationalize it, we're going to modernize it, and we're going to make sure that we're still delivering not only the value of today and the outcomes today, but more value. And oh, by the way, we're going to make it easier to engage with us. We're going to remove the friction, and we're going to make it their, their choice in how they want to work with us. And so brought in the services product management team. Customer success started with digital scale, also high touch. I have a huge middle layer that, to be blunt, I'm ignoring right now because I want to make sure if I can get digital right, every customer will value from that. If I can get high touch right, then our largest customers will value from that. And then I can figure out the middle. I can figure out what's sticking, what's working, where, where is the middle layer really ultimately going to sit. And partner success was the same. How do we want to enable, because at Extreme, we are a channel-led business. How are we going to enable our partners to embody the, the success, the experience that we want our customers to have, and also further their success in how they work with us, and how they work with our customers, and how they grow and scale their own businesses. So we looked at digital as well as high touch there. That one is still a work in progress, I must say. <laughs> that one has a lot more, um, let's just say there's a lot more work to be done in how we create that connective tissue and how we're going to work through it. And then lastly, it's operations. And for me, this is a three-parter. First, it's the actual processes our operating capabilities. It's, it's really defining not the handoffs, but I call them handshakes between the different teams as we go through the journey. Um, and it's all of our systems and tools. There's also the journey management, the journey mapping pieces um, for how we work and partner with our friends over in um, our product and user experience organization and the mappings that they're doing. Um, and then it's also the, the last piece is the success programs. So voice of the customer, really partnering with marketing on references, referrals, use case development, all of those fun things that we know we need to have. And so with that, 
technology became central. <laughs> um, and you may look at this and say, oh, of course you need a CRM. Of course you need to have a product experience platform if you do not have telemetry in your current product set and you're building it. You need some way to start to garner that to be successful. And then lastly, it was, how are we going to do all these amazing things with our customers? How are we going to engage them and manage that experience and make it consistent and scale? And so for me, you know, as you all now know, this is my third time selecting Tatango. Um, I love the product. I love the capabilities. It enables you to move fast. It enables you to be you know, very, not reactive in a negative way, but as you see things, you can react and immediately improve the experience of your customer as well as your team. And for me, this was a, Pendo was a partnership with product because this was really about which, which capabilities are they gonna build into product while they're also building telemetry into the product. So this was a partnership between us. And Salesforce was actually a choice. So one of the key things in that, remember the, the process adherence piece. Um, so we decided early on the friction from the processes that sales had today, because primarily a hardware business, we, are, we were transforming, but we were not deprecating. So we will continue to optimize and thrive in the hardware space. We were building, and we are still building, our capabilities in an adjacent revenue line, a complementary business model. And so what we realized was that we did not and could not break our core business. So we actually implemented a new instance of Salesforce to facilitate all of our subscription business and integrate back where we needed to with, um, with our core Salesforce. So it gave us some data integrity in the subscription side for me to hook into, but it also enabled us to still communicate and stay entrenched in lockstep with the hardware side where we had those overlaps, those capabilities, and we needed those seamless experiences. Um, this was much to the dismay of some folks because, again, it was, when are you going to get there? How fast can you go? Um, and so the first six months was really building. We were heads down, we were building, and this is what we were building. So what did we execute? Um, in phase one, which we just went live with our first phase of Tango, our first set of capabilities into Tango on January 17th of this year, um, the first thing that we introduced was journey mapping, onboarding, and health. Now the last two bullets, those are my bullets. Um, because one of the most amazing things about having a trusted team that you enable, you empower, and you unleash them to do the other work, it enabled me to focus on the other side of be it building a CS team, which is what's our operating model, what's the handshakes with all of our key stakeholders across the journey, what is our cost model, so how are we going to pay for ourselves and pay for our capabilities, and then also really focusing on the customer success scorecard. So this, you know, January 17th was a big day for us. We were very excited. Um, and again, and I'll show you some of our execution metrics, but we did ring fence the customer cohort that we went live with. And we did this for many reasons. First and foremost, I wanted to tie back to where I started, why Extreme brought me here. So the cohort that I picked was the freemium customers. That was the cohort that we decided we were going to implement to tango with first so that we could show success to the main driver and show return on the investment that Extreme had made. And so that has worked really well for us. In April, we have a rolling schedule of the following. In tandem, even though we didn't do it live in January, we've been very heavily focused and heads down building out adoption and usage. We've also been very focused on success plans and templatized success plans, because remember, we had identified those customer outcomes. We know they're not perfect, but we're going to iterate and go as we learn from our customers that we implement them with. The other side is we've also built nine different upsell and cross-sell plays. One of the key pieces here was getting parity with sales on how they define upsell, <laughs> how they define cross-sell so that what we were building, how we were going to measure, 
it actually had impact, meaningful, tangible impact that we could measure. And we would be talking together versus apart. Um, and then we also are looking at customer satisfaction, really formalizing it. As many companies, even though Extreme is 25 years in the making, we do measure NPS. We do do customer satisfaction. But we could use some structure. And we're going to improve upon what we have so that we can get much more rigorous in how we look at that and how we understand what the data is telling us. And then lastly is renewals. So we have a renewal sales team, but the actual renewal motions are sitting in my team. So we're building the plays from 190 days up to the 45-day mark. And then at 45 days, there's partnership with the renewal sales team. If it's not a seamless transaction, meaning there's any negotiation, there's any kind of additional, the sales team is engaged, they are doing it. But we are testing that right now with a group of customers, and it's working really, really well. And then lastly, so my fiscal year, um, it goes from July to June. So we're coming up on our last quarter of the fiscal year. Um, so what we're looking to launch as we go into July, we're in the planning stages now. My budget is due tonight, um, which was, again, great timing. Um, but for the future phases, which is next fiscal year, the pieces that I'm focused on is not just continuing to improve, iterate, and then expand all of these plays into the next set of products that we focus on. The next piece is truly around a try before you buy freemium experience, it's loyalty programs, it's the success portal, so if you wanna have a digital experience, in my experience, that is your most critical path item, is that you have a mechanism for your customers and or partners to engage with you. Um, and again, voice of customer, voice of partner, really formalizing those programs so that we get meaningful feedback. Our offerings are through the digital scale and high touch, so this is our earmarks again, and then we'll figure out the middle Probably, honestly, as we go into fiscal year 24. I think the next 12 months are really going to be critical in how we start to shake things out and really learn from what we're doing. Um, and then lastly, our sales motions are direct and through channel, and we're still figuring out how we're working together with sales and partnerships and how those things are start to work. Um, one of the key pieces for us is that I, I have not defined us as post-sales. I've defined us as part of the customer's journey. And when we map the customer's journey, we're always indicating which partnerships are happening at which stage. So we don't just indicate our milestones and our key tasks. We're actually working with sales, with marketing, especially growth marketing along the way to say, OK, let's make sure that, number one, we're all on the same page with what we're delivering. Number two, it's tangible, and we can, in a meaningful way, show it back. And then number three, we're continuously improving in how we operate and how we do it. Um, so I thought I'd share my scorecard. Um, I get asked a lot, well, what are y'all going to measure? And so for me, um, my key areas, and this aligns to our stages of the customer journey where we're engaged, um, these are the metrics that we baselined. And for some of them, it was amazing because easiest baseline exercise in the world, we have no data to support it today. <laughs> so we're starting from you know, a blank sheet, a blank graph, which means there's no way to go but up. <laughs> so everything is going to be a win. And in other cases, we do have data to support it. And even though it may not be a great metric today, it tells us where we need to focus. It tells us where we need to invest. And it tells us where we need to improve. So for me, even though, because a lot of people ask, well, why would you start measuring something before you get started? Well, it's always easy to wait till the data tells you what you want. It's even harder to just let the data tell you what you need. Um, and so for me, that's, this is where I started. And then last but not least, as I promised, um, what we would show from our execution to date, um, as, I, as I shared, um, my total customer base for all of Extreme is about 65,000 accounts. Obviously, was not going to do that on day one. Um, but what we focused on was we further segmented into our subscription customers 
And then we really focused on that one cohort, which is participating in the freemiums, so that we could get good ground and we could really measure what was working and what wasn't. So today we have almost 1,400 accounts live. We've completed 2,222 2, touch points. Um, that's how many touch points we've logged. Tasks completed, almost 2,500. And the accounts that we have in onboarding right now are 1,100. Um, this is the first time in extreme history that they actually can see what their customers are doing for a product. So it's pretty amazing. I'm very proud of the team. And then lastly, talking a little bit about Tatango adoption. So again, quarters for me, um, my Q4 was last summer for 2021. That was when we first engaged Tatango and contracted with them. I actually contracted with Tatango before I had a team. Like, I just knew that I needed it. So I started that process because I knew it would be a process um, on the extreme side. And so if you notice, we're now in my Q4 today, and we have close to 76% adoption. And so we're very, very close to where we want to be in that the people that should be in the system are going into the system. They're adopting. This is where they're doing their work. And really, the laggards are more, are more on the executive level that they haven't fully understood what they should go in and look at yet. Those are where we still have work to do, and we're going to continue to educate. And I think that's it.